Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online series. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Tim Blanks, Editor at Large of the Business of Fashion, and Dr. Valerie Steele, Director and Chief Curator of the Museum at FIT, as they discuss Blanks' book, Versace, The Complete Collections. This is a comprehensive presentation of Versace's women's wear collections from 1978 to today. We hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for joining us today. Valerie, it's a, it's a treat to see you. It's been way too long. So why don't you start by telling our audience who was Gianni Versace and why is he so important to fashion history? Gianni Versace was, in hindsight, a fashion revolutionary uh, in, in the sense that he was a designer who was able to change the, the industry. He had a very particular point of view which defied fashion orthodoxy and it generated a whole new strand of fashion DNA. I think, and, and it's interesting that the more time passes, the more the things that he was criticized for or not particularly well understood for resonate as, as a truly original fashion voice, I think. Yes, yes, I remember Richard Martin talking about how controversial he was, and yet that's an, the essence of why he was so important. He courted it. I mean, he was shame. He was shameless. He was shameless in a rather, uh, in a rather delightful way. In hindsight, I think he he knew high culture extremely well. He felt opera and art and the Renaissance. He felt Italian high culture, but he also absolutely relished low culture. You know, he relished celebrity culture and, and gossip and, and, you know, his mother dressed hookers in their hometown, Reggio Calabria. And he, um, he, he loved style. And it, I don't think he really mattered where the style came from. And, I think that was the, the sort of shamelessness, the, the, the enthusiasm, the exultant quality of that was hugely influential for, for, especially for kids now, I think. Yes. Let's look at the next picture. How would you describe the main characteristics of his style when he first started to become really famous in the 1980s? I mean, there's something sort of hookerish about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that he, when he's, when he's, when he left his hometown and moved to Milan, he, he kind of became a gun for hire, and he uh, he worked for a number of big Italian labels um, at the very beginning of his career before he opened his own shop in Milan, and I think that. What he what he what he perfected at the very beginning was um, as a, a sort of an ability to cut and drape. He 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 was one of those designers. I mean, you can you can think of a handful more. I think that Alexander McQueen is probably a good example as well uh, of somebody who could cut on a on a on a on a form. I think it was Diane of Vreeland who actually said that watching Gianni Versace work was an education because he was just able to create from a bolt of fabric, he could make an outfit. And, and so I think that from the very beginning, you saw his ability to drape. And, and I think this is a very, very early look. Yeah. Also, he, um, he loved the sensuality of, I mean, he was a very sensual designer. Yeah. He loved the tactility of skin. So he used leather, which was... Skin. 
you know, which was, if you think of the, of the Florentine tradition in Italian fashion, leather was very important. And, and Versace was somebody who was able to elevate leather to yeah. a very, to, to a very high fashion level. So Versace was known for emphasizing women's bodies, but here also you can see him playing with, with gender and with the tropes of masculinity and, and versus femininity. From the very beginning, I think he, he had a very strong sense of the feminine and the masculine working together. Like, like I said, he, he, he challenged orthodoxy. And I think that it, at that time in Italian fashion, um, the way Italian fashion was making its presence felt in the world was, was by bringing masculine elements into, into, into feminine fashion. I, I mean, his great rival Armani, that was his, that was his signal achievement at the very beginning of his career to, to bring the, the sort of structured essence of, of menswear into women's wear and to create this, not necessarily a harder edge, but a more tailored, precise, Edge, which of course Versace was able to play off against that intensely feminine thing that he did yeah. as well. Although whereas, whereas Armani in a way made men's fashion more sensual and women's more powerful, Versace seems to be doing something different as, as he plays with that masculine feminine. It's like he brings them clashing together in, in a different kind of way. I think that's a I think that's a great notion, uh, but I but I think I think that, that they were both similarly uh, fascinated by the idea of power of making yes. of making women's wear powerful. Yes, and I think that was because Versace grew up surrounded by powerful women. His mother was a huge influence on him. Her clientele of the local dignitaries and the, I mean, the, the powerful street walkers yeah. of Reggio. Um, and, and I think the notion of, of, of infusing power into women's wear was very, very important for him. Let's look at the next image. Is this the Klimt collection? This is the Klimt collection. And I chose this image because it also highlights the metal mesh mm. and, and something that that while I was working on this book, something that, that really was rammed home for me was how innovative Versace was as a designer, that he, he saw the mesh of butcher's aprons and he wanted to find a way to make that a fab because he loved the sinuousness, sinuousness of it and the, and the, the, the flu of, of the metal mesh of a butcher's apron which in itself is a pretty extreme idea. Yes, yes. But he had to find somebody who could convert that into a fabric he could use in, in women's wear. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a kind of experimental process for him when he found the, the manufacturer who could produce the metal mesh for him. And um, this, this was, it's it's funny. I mean, when I, I, when I think of Versace as a revolutionary, I think of Armani as a revolutionary. You don't often hear them referred to as revolutionaries, but if you think of what Versace was doing with this fabric, and how well this is a perfect perfect kind of perfect kind of synthesis of his interest in uh, high high fashion. He loved. I mean, high culture. He loved. The Vienna Secession, yes, and he he was fascinated by the the rigor and the um, the radical the radical quality of the Vienna Secession, which and Gustav Klimt, of course, is a yeah. apogee of that. Yes, so he did a collection based on Klimt, but then when he did a, when he did Klimt motifs in this metal mesh that had become one of his his own signatures, it 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 just is. It, it is fashion as art, or art as fashion, and and I think that we think of the time that he was doing this it is is it is quite a radical proposition. I think that's extraordinary. And your book was so useful that way because you unearthed things that 
I didn't know about all that research he did into the metal mesh, which is such an incredibly powerful component of his repertoire of materials. And you don't think of it, you don't think of it as being the first time that somebody had done that. And you know, I love a fashion first. I do love a fashion first and how hard it is to actually find real ones. You yeah. know, the first time, like the first time somebody used a zipper, for example. Yeah. And we see metal mesh, metal mesh has become this kind of called chain mail as well, but I prefer metal mesh has, has, be, has become, you know, part of the fashion vocabulary, but Versace was the person who did it first. Fantastic. Let's look at the next one. There's a, here's a good example of a kind of powerful glamour that you've got. I mean, you've got drape, you've got the leg exposure and wrapping the hips and, and yet you've also got that really powerful shoulders and just the way it's styled, the hair and makeup, everything is very much a sort of phallic woman. And, and, and also the drape of this, I yes. think, um, that the shoulder and the, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of 80s, obviously the very strong 80s quality in that, the broad shoulder and the, and sort of the V. But Versace's particular, uh, particular skill in draping and in highlighting, also shortening the skirt, broadening the shoulders, yeah. an aggressive, an aggressive look yeah. for, um, for the for for the time, I mean, this this was when I think he really began to um, have a huge impact in America. Yeah, and and I think he was. I mean, everything about that, the, the hair, the earrings, yeah. uh, the bracelet, the whole the whole thing is is just so in your face. Yes. Um, not nothing shy and retiring. And you can see these sort of germs here of the things that would grow later on into much, much more confrontational. I mean, the notion of bondage here, it's subtle, but he would go on to explore yes. that in much, much more graphic detail. Exactly. And the hint of the Baroque, still just a hint, but about to really, really flourish. Let's look at the next one. I'm trying to find my own notes. Oh, this was this this is fabulous. A, a, a very young Iman, and the shape Iman. is like a, what an amphora is that like Amphor that? an amphora an amphora shape, and um, I don't know if this is such a young Iman, but Iman was one of his favorite models. And this is an interesting thing about Versace is he was using well, you know, French designers were using black models all the time as well. But he was he used black models a lot, um, and and I think it's interesting when you see when you see these shows when you look at these shows and um, I'm just pulling out my own list here. When you look at these shows, um, you just see the the kind of diversity of them, which nobody ever there was never a point made about the diversity of these shows. You know, they just were. They just were a big polyglot of models. Another thing I didn't know about Versace was he was really, really obsessed with Paul Poiré. Oh, from the beginning of the twentieth, from the beginning of the twentieth century, Poiré was one of his favorite designers, and so when he looked at Poiré's Art Nouveau designs, and also Art Nouveau, obviously. Yeah. He was, um, he was, the, the amphora shape was his tribute to a costume that, that Paul Poiré designed for a party at the turn of the century. Ah, oh, perfect. And that amphora kind of silhouette, uh, which crops up a few times in Versace, that sort of very exaggerated kind of hip thing. Uh, as a, it was a it was a fancy dress look which he yes. accepted and um, I, I I wasn't at these shows in the eighties but um, I, I I mean admittedly there was there was Gauthier there was a lot of there was there was Lacroix 
there was a lot of um, there were a lot of amazing things happening in fashion, a lot of amazing silhouettes. But I just try to imagine that coming down a catwalk. Yeah, and how it must have really struck people. The eighties were were a period though of amazing, strong, big biomorphic shapes. They're really powerful. The theatricality of this, of course, fits in with his interest in opera, theater, and poires as well. Absolutely. Um, I mean, he was also, at the same time as um, he was fascinated by Poiré, he was fascinated by Oscar Schlemmer. Yes. And so you get the, you get that, I mean, these are the, de these are the sort of intricacies of Versace that I found so fascinating, so kind of unsung in let's, a way. Let's look at the next one. This is also a, a really bold, bright, theatrical, uh, look at me kind of dress. Uh, and this was Iman again. Yes. Um, and um, this was, uh, I would say, I call this the beginning of his supermodel era because this is when the this is this is actually from this point on it's the Versace that Versace that it's the Versace that people know yes it's the Versace that people recognize for its um for its its showiness its audacity it's uh, it's just completely unambiguous you know and and he was in this particular instance he was extremely um he was he was he was bringing Calder, Alexander Calder, oh. into his, into his vocabulary as well, and so you see Calder's circus, yeah, in this collection. At this time, he was also um, designing for Zizi Jean Mer. Oh, which is really interesting because that was Samaron. Samaron yes. designed for Zizi yes. So. Um, I think there was in this in this particular particular collection. I think, <coughs> excuse me. He, this was this was the first. I think this was the first throwdown. This collection where he really went hell bent for leather with the fabulous extreme of shape and decoration, but was also um, the, the other the shorts in this collection were, were considered to be scandalously short. Yeah. The skirts, the skirts in this collection were considered to be scandalously short, so. It's um, kind of extreme beauty, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 you know, the beginning of the 90s, welcome to the 90s. And the supermodels. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, remember the 90, the end of the 90s, the age of excess, the end of the 80s, the yes. age of excess. This was a perfect encapsulation of that in a way. Let's look at the next image. Now this, this was the first, same, same idea. This was his first, first couture show at the Ritz yes. in Paris, where he covered the swimming pool in the basement in the health club. And, um, and did a show. Those were the days when you had great, great shows. I think they were the days when you had, when when designers made incredibly strong statements in haute couture. Yes. Um, I mean, this was a time of I think of Ungaro and Saint Laurent shows that ran for an hour and a half. Yeah. Remember they had like 200 looks? I know, insane, nobody would sit through it now. No, no to like 10 minutes. Nobody. And, and, and this was, I think this, this was Versace's love affair to, this was this, the, Versace's love letter to Paris. Um, you, see the, you see it on the dress there. Um, the uh, au revoir à Paris. This, absolutely, yeah. Oh, sorry. This is Christy Turlington from behind. And the fabulous thing is Christy Turlington from the front in this look. This was, you know, you can, you can actually define Versace, Versace's career with a series of moments, of, of moments that completely transcended fa the fashion media 
and hit the mainstream media. This, I think this was maybe one of the first big ones. Yeah. Chrissy Turlington in this dress that was literally held by a single snap at the back. So when she was walking down the catwalk, <laughs> wow. the whole audience was waiting for the snap to pop. I mean, there, there is the construction of this, the sort of the elegance, the, the efficiency of it, the, and, the, and again, the audacity. Yes. And Christy at this point, this was, I think this was, I, you'd say this was sort of before Supermodel, the supermodel thing was kicking off, but it hadn't really not yet gelled yet. Really gone. And so yeah. these these girls were not yet massive media stars, the massive media stars that they would become. But I this dress is the 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 the, the structure of this dress is kind of awe inspiring. It's a brilliant dress. Let's look at the next one. Now we've got Naomi in Maryland. Okay, this is when I think you could you could safely say that the supermodel um, the supermodel moment was gelling. Now um, the, the 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 sort of boldness of this collection with, with Marilyn and James Dean on this dress and the the the. The Vogue, the Vogue magazine cover, the yeah. cover dress, and the and the just the sort of embrace of pop, that which was a which was a which was a you know Warholian pop, yeah. which was a a kind of synthesis of again of the high culture, the low culture thing that I think is pretty is pretty significant throughout Versace's career, but. Um, this this was when when you saw this copy when you saw this in a, on a t-shirt in Leicester Square you kind of got the you got the the reach of of the man that his appeal how he was a designer who jumped into mass media shamelessly jumped into mass media and, you know, the kind of women who wore these dresses, you wonder, it was a new, it was a whole new moment. It was a, a, it was a, it was a whole new thing for, for couture to have these, have clothes like this, I think, um, that's so, so gleefully embraced, um, uh, gleefully embraced pop culture the way he did. Yes, these are really brilliant. Every time you put something from this collection in an exhibition, it just jumps. It, it really says outstanding work of art. Continuing with this theme of supermodels. I think this was, this was the show that, um, this was the show that really, uh, that really blew the whole um, supermodel phenomenon Worldwide, yeah. Um, uh, fall, fall, nineteen ninety one. Um, these these models had been. I mean, the, the, the whole this whole this whole moment, the fusion of designer, editor, stylist, model, photographer, the way that all came together in this in this particular thing. This yeah. this to me, you know, the supermodel phenomenon. I always think of it as being like Hollywood. Yeah. in the golden era of Hollywood. So you had the producer who was, who was the producer in this case? Well, whoever the money men were. Yes. Uh, you had Versace as, as a director. You had um, the, the stars. You had the, the stylist. Of the, who was the stylist for this show? Good Lord, I should know that, shouldn't I? But then the fact that these girls had, had been in the George Michael video six months before, mouthing along to Freedom 90, and then um, coming out to that song on the catwalk. Um, I think this is also an, an instance of Donatella's influence on her brother. Um, she pushed him to 
towards this kind of symbiosis. Use the girls who are using in your ads on your catwalk because fashion didn't do that. Yeah, fashion fashion traditionally kept the the magazine models and the catwalk models very separate. Mm -hmm. And and the, I don't know whether it was Liz Tilbaris who had a big uh, something to say about this as well to push him. But this was a moment when that whole notion of this consistency across your whole presentation. Um, and it was just such an incredible thing to see as well. It's funny when you see the video now, it's so joyful. It, and it fits in with the whole celebrity thing. It's about music and fashion. It's about celebrity, everyone becoming famous. It's very Warholian too. The supermodels, the super designer as well, hanging out with the other super musician celebrities. And that was, I feel that was the beginning of, that was, this was the beginning of the 90s, the whole thing that happened in fashion in the 90s, fashion going mega, you know, fashion becoming, fashion becoming a branch of the entertainment industry, fashion becoming part of show business. Uh, I think that that's really what we saw beginning right yeah. here. Absolutely. And it had been growing all through the 80s because fashion was so fashionable. Suddenly it had could stake a claim to being as important as Hollywood and music videos. Yeah, and, and these, these women took over from movie stars yeah. as sort of style leaders. But this was also the moment where I could say to my mother in New Zealand, have you heard of Gianni Versace? And she would say, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Like five years earlier, no, I mean, right. no. Fashion hadn't Im imprinted itself. Fashion imprinted itself on people. Everybody just, knew about it, Ben. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Taxi drivers it's knew about it. Yeah. Let's look at the next one. I think that um, the, in, the, in this particular collection where Versace was using um, this, fu this fusion of uh, like putting, putting a denim shirt, denim jacket with a Fragonard skirt, Yes. It was, um, I think for him, for him he, he the, the Baroque and Rococo had been very, very important to him growing up where he grew yes. up. Um, that, that sort of Italian tradition and um, the romance of that and the, and then the sort of realism of uh, the, the denim. This was, a, I think this was a very important um, moment for him to combine street and salon in, in a way. Also, you, I kind of thought of these things as a bit of a repast to critics because he always had critics. Mm. He always had critics who thought, who thought you know, I think the accusation of vulgarity was probably the one that was made against him most of all. Yes. And I think there was something so soft in this and so, and so almost well, like a Fragonard, like the swing. Yes. Or, or Watto, you know, that, 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 those classic 18th century images, but then putting them with a denim shirt um, to, uh, to kind of ground them in now, but and 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 I think that in in a funny way that um, this look also um, it it was maybe more accessible, much more so. Maybe. Yes, yeah. This this is something, of course, that people could pick up on, and he was yeah. selling denim things as well. So you have a whole a whole other branch there that you could envision styling your denim Versace shirt, at least in fantasy with, you know, an evening skirt or with something else more casual. Denim but then I think, you know, that I, I do think, I do the whole, I, I do think his, his career was a great dialogue between, it was a great call and response thing. So he would do this, which had a sort of accessibility and then he would do our next look, Okay, let's look at the next one. 
which was <laughs> literally the next collection, which was uh, um, from that sort of lovely Rococo couture to this uh, Miss S&M. Miss S&M, they're my favorite oh, collection. It is your favorite, tell me oh, why. It is. I love this. Well, I was working on fetish when this came out. And I remember asking a bunch of leather fetishists what they thought of this show. And they're like, we hate it. And I said, but <laughs> it's, it's you, it's so fabulous. It's so beautiful. And they said, yeah, but but people used to mean what, what they wore told you what they liked. And now it's just a fashion statement. And you know, I said, well, just suck it up because that's what happens with every great look. It's always incorporated into the fashion system. But it is such a great look. It's your classic fetish s and look. But you can understand why it was, why it inflamed people. Yeah. Why, um, why fashion editors were, were, were just furious. Oh, chic, or is it chic or cruel, asked the New York Times. Everybody was horrified by this look that implied that women were somehow, you know, prostitute dominatrixes. Which, which Versace would have said, yeah, right, to, you know, <laughs> sure. But I love Kathy Horan said it was Little House on the Prairie meets Marquis de Sade, which I thought, <laughs> like, I mean, that, he gave people a great opportunity to write wonderful things yeah. you know like how nice to have a designer that you could really go to town on oh, in your pro or con arguments heavy metal light bondage was another one someone wrote oh, yeah. you know it was such it was it caught everybody's eye even there were cartoons in the new yorker making fun of this well it was definitely uh definitely a way that uh, definitely another way that fashion imprinted itself on a on a on a popular audience you know it, 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 suddenly uh, the catwalks of milan would be in people magazine yeah uh I, do you remember people wearing these clothes apart from donatella people wore elements from them usually not the full most elaborate looks but yes we have we have several from this collection in that were donated to us or that we bought at auction so they would definitely were worn and I think probably worn a lot more than people think. I, and I think it's interesting, of course, that these images, I, I chose one of these images and they do tend to be the images that people go back to when they're talking about this period. But another designer that, that, um, that uh, Versace loved was Charles James. Yeah. And there was a whole Western element in this show apart yes. from the bondage, um, which was, which, do you remember Naomi Campbell wearing the dress of the porcupine quills? Yes, yes, and a whole kind of lust in the dust kind of cowboy yeah. thing was going on. Which kind of fitted with this. It's so, it was so, it was so cinematic, I thought. Yes. And, and then, Obviously, something that, that Versace was absorbed by, you could even say the bondage was an expression of this as well, was American, um, was American culture. Um, Charles James, uh, um, the, the, the Western element. The, and then, and then when he did, after he discovered South Beach uh, in, in Miami, um, that became, that became, a huge, like a constant subtext in his work. And I think I can, I think you can safely say this was maybe the first collection where he actually took that on board um, and, and had models walking down the catwalk in these white dresses, summery white dresses with bare feet. Well, and Miami that, Beach, that was that was such a body worshiping place, and these are the ultimate kind of body worshiping clothes. It's hard to tell what which is sexier, the body exposure or the way it's just tracing all of the lines of the body. Well, it, it was it was almost like it was the environment he was waiting for. Yes. To fully the, the actual physical environment that embodied his own his own sense of of sensuality, sexuality, mm -hmm. um, and 
and the sort of unabashed, uh, unabashed sexuality, actually. I think for men and for women, he, he found South Beach to be a, a perfect place for him to kind of pursue, um, pursue uh, maybe appetites, you'd say, yeah. that, he'd, that he'd always had, that he was able to indulge himself um, also at a time when South Beach, you know, it was when South Beach was first becoming a big deal. Yeah. And it was such a dump and suddenly it was really hot. And there yeah. were all these cute guys sort of roller skating around wearing short shorts. And it was a, a really kind of Wild West kind of place in a way, a Wild West did, of pleasure. Did you go there? I was there at one point, yeah, at the transition. And it was, you know, you went a couple blocks in the wrong direction and it was really dangerous. Yeah, no, I never, I never, never got to experience um, South, South Beach in those days. I, I got there when it was really kind of <laughs> she, she, well, too bad. Let's do the next one. Oh, wow. Now I chose this because I think it, 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 it reflects something else that Versace had, which was a, a real knack for the zeitgeist. He, yeah. he, was, he was so on top of everything all the time. Um, and he was aware of grunge. And I think this is, uh, when you look at this, it, it, it feels to me like, you know, he knew what Mark Jacobs had done at Perry Ellis. And he felt um, times changing. I think for himself, that maybe the Baroque, the, the ornate, the, or, the ornateness of the clothing up, up to this, up to this point, he was moving on. I mean, what was happening in fashion was well, things like Helmut Lang, voices like Hel yeah. Helmut Lang were beginning to be heard. And, he, and Versace knew all of this. He was aware of all of this. In the same way that if you go back and look at some of the more um, frou-frou, flouncy things was him acknowledging Christian Lacroix. Yes. And I, I, think, I, think, I think Versace was actually a great fan of fashion. Oh, and I think he, so too. And he, and he looked at everything that... Yeah, yeah, I think he looked at what other designers were doing and he was enthusiastic about other people. Most Just of like it. He was interested in different kinds of art. No, I'm sure you're right. He was looking at fashion, listening to Nirvana. He was soaking all of this up. I don't know if he was listening to Nirvana. Donatella would have been listening to Nirvana and exactly. telling him about it. <laughs> exactly. Let's see the next one. The other, the other super, super famous one. I mean, this, if the, if the previous image talk showed him picking up on grunge, here it's sort of uh, a late in the day, but incredibly powerful picking up on punk. I mean, it'd been a long time since safety pins were going through people's lips in, in London. And this wasn't, this wasn't exactly uh, the dress that Li that Liz Hurley wore, Elizabeth Hurley wore. I think it's Helena. I think Helena wore the dress that Elizabeth Hurley wore. But I think again, I, I do feel, I, I do feel that Versace's um, uh, Versace was astute in in that he had Christie in that black dress, however many years before. Yes. And to put her in this dress, bring back a memory of that, you know, that, that incredible, that coup, that moment yes. for him that was a real coup. Uh, again, the structure, the sort of audacity here that these dresses were a snap away from being a major mal a wardrobe malfunction. Yeah. Um, I think that, that, uh, he he, he he was very, very good at iconography 
and using that sort of the punk iconography here. I remember what you remember when Sandra Rhodes did her sure. punk safety pin dresses yes. in the, in 77, 78, yes. and she how she got pilloried yes. for it. And there's something about the way that Versace did it, it was just if somebody said anything, just so what? Yeah. So what? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I remember at the at the opening of the punk show at the Met, and Donatella was there, and I overheard her saying something like, Johnny invented punk fashion. And I kind of thought, well, <laughs> not really, but he certainly reinvented it here with a, a new, very glamorous look. I mean, it even seems to me to reference Roland Barth's idea about that it's where the clothing gaps that it's sexiest, that it's not just a question of exposing one or another erogenous zone, but instead it's just that the opening, the opening of the uh, garment at a certain point, at almost any point. But it, it's, what, it's what great movie directors have always understood, Hitchcock, you know, it's what you don't show. Yes. That matters more than what you do show. Yeah. It's brilliant. I chose this uh, this look because this this again is um this this is again is Versace embracing. Um I, I feel him now moving more, not not so much minimal minimalism just yet, but a more of a sort of techno quality in in um in the clothing that i did there was something rather hilarious about this this particular collection in that he he insisted that the collection had been motivated by research into factory and country workers clothing so there were sort of bibbed there were overall bibs okay. and 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 he he, he wanted i think he he imagined it as being a, a sort of functional um a very functional collection of clothing um also he had been looking i think at jackie kennedy and um so there was a, a, a there was a sort of quality in this uh, maybe, maybe kind of innocence, like the, a Camelot style innocence. Kate Moss in a in a in a roll neck sweater and a uh -huh. little, but still, I think a little bit of Warhol there. Oh, I think so with the silver, sure. Yeah, a little bit Edie, a little mm -hmm. you know, definitely. Boxy. Yeah, and the um, Kate look is so different too from the glamazon look of the, his more famous models his previously famous models. Because this was this was when um, this sort of the waif. Exactly. I think Donna Keller drove the, it was, it was a transition between the glamour from the age of the glamazon mm -hmm. to the age of the waif. Exactly. And, and so there was more Kate, there was more Amber Valletta, there was more Shalom Harlow. Yes. Um, and the clothing, reflected that I guess although you did get to see Linda in you know a little pink boucle suit and yeah, they, they never uh, disappeared they were still there they were still there yes let's see the next one and you still you did in addition to the more low-key young things you did have references to again to very high fashion and very glamorous fashion, albeit here more stripped down. Uh, you know, when we talked before about, about him loving um, movies, Charles, Charles James, one and Charles James's great client was Millicent Rogers. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, because um, who was who else did Millicent was the dressed Millicent Rogers. She she hired people to do strange things like little Austrian dirndls and she wore Southwestern Native American jewelry. She, apart from James, she wasn't really associated in a big way with other designers. It was all sort of her own persona creating looks of drawn she, on other themes. She did work with Charles James a lot, didn't she? A lot, absolutely, very lot. And I think that, that 
Um, you know, that, 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 that's something else I didn't know. That was when Gianni Versace used to buy clothes for his mother's boutique in Reggio Calabria, he would go to Paris on buying trips. And during those trips, he became friendly with Karl Lagerfeld. I didn't know that they were old friends. And th at, this, at this moment, um, which was the end of the 20th century, the 1995 anyway, and, and Lagerfeld was talking about the fin de siècle and a new ballet park. Mm -hmm. Women's Wear Daily was, was, was uh, translating this as conservative chic. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you saw here for sure, with a little envelope purse and the gloves and a this is conservative sheet. Yes, yes. And the hair. Very ladylike. Yeah, this is ladylike. This is this is um, this is Versace cycling around to all the various it, it, all the various looks he's explored in this collection. He it was a couture collection, and he touched on all of the great couturiers. He touched on Madame Grey, Vionnet, Charles James, Balenciaga, Dior. This was his kind of tribute. But at the same time, you know, he's doing it his way. Yeah, it's very sexy. Although yeah. it's also very just sort of chic, classic chic. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, I don't know. It's, a, it's that little black dress. It's not Audrey Hepburn, is it? Uh, well, it could be referencing that a little bit. It's hard to see a dress like that without thinking of her, that's for sure. Which brings in a whole other subtext that's not so ladylike. Yes. Think of the, the movie roles. Yeah. Let's look at the next one. Oh, wow. Kate Moss as a space age bride. It was... Um, the, this was from a couture collection that Versace did where um, everything was very deliberately futuristic. Yes. There were, the, everything was zippered. There were no buttons or, or snaps or anything. The whole collection was, was built on zips. And this was also um, when, he, when he fell ill, when he had a cancer of the inner ear and he had to step back from the company for a little while. And so the, the, the story was that in this particular collection, which was quite a departure, that Donatella, who'd been deputized to run things while he was recuperating, took it to this more, yes. space, more spacey, futuristic kind of place. Which um, is so retro, because every time people try and do the future, it ends up being very retro. And this looks right back to Courage and all of that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 2001. <laughs> that sort of, yeah, that sort of fits with um, with the last collection's Couturier, so quotes from Couturier. But of course, the rumor was he wasn't happy with this, that, that this happened in his absence. So, he, but, but you know, the, the, it's funny that you can, I guess you can see at the time that there might've been issues, but hindsight is so strange in fashion that you go back and you look at things that people didn't like in the time and they've either been, they've either been softened with time or toughened with time or they seem more relevant or they seem like more of a comment on the moment that they mm -hmm. did. Um, when they're divorced from context, they take on a whole new power. And I actually thought this collection was kind of great. But yeah. Who am I? <laughs> Only the great expert. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, here again, very sort of minimal, minimal modernist. Well, this was some Versace's, um, Gianni Versace's last collection at yes. the Ritz in um, July 1997. Um, he was murdered nine days after this show. And it, 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 like, ex after everything I just said about hindsight, learning things, this emotional kind of weight, or it's very, very hard to look at this collection and not see a presentiment of, of something in it, that it was so rigorous and strict and dark and heavy with this strange sort of 
religiosity. He used all these Byzantine crosses throughout the collection after he'd seen the, an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, he'd taken it to heart, the glory of Byzantium. And um, at the same time, as there was this, that intensity, that sort of, that sort of almost erotic religiosity, there was, this, this felt to me like a collection where he truly acknowledged the influence of somebody, the importance of somebody like Helmut Lang. I mean, the way the model's heads were bound with these leather bands and the strictness of the tailoring, the, the, the pinstripes, the, the black and white, the sort of monochrome quality, the, the, um, the, 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 the sort of paired back power of this collection. Mm. I felt at the time, um, I, I, even sitting in the audience, you felt, wow. You thought, this is just so powerful. And, and especially knowing that he'd been ill, knowing he was coming back to the business. Yeah. And, and because you know, for a while, the rumors were that he wouldn't return. Right. And um, coming back to the business and feeling him taking the reins again, but with a new, with a new attitude. It felt like this was the start of the next chapter. Um, it really did feel like that. It's funny, it wasn't even hindsight. When you walked out and people mm. would talk about it, you really felt, wow, this is... And then, of course, nine days later, he was murdered. So one of the great fashion ironies, because nobody will ever know what would have happened um, next. But this was such a blueprint. Yeah, and then the whole next, the hell, the whole next bit of the story begins with Donatella taking over from her brother, and that last collection is so interesting because she she was able to take on board so much of what he had done for herself, but she never could come to grips with that last collection for a long time. She just she shied away from, from I guess the implications of it, or I don't know what it, what it was, but I think emotionally it was just too hard for her to go there, and and I felt when she did, I thought that was such a huge moment for her that it it really it really said to me now she was perfectly comfortable because. You know, initially she wasn't comfortable with with um, taking over um, from her brother. Um, it was, I think, who would be comfortable? No, and and I think pe most people, although they wished her well, didn't really think she could do it. I mean, she was the kid sister. He was the genius designer. How could she take over? Yes, and the level of expectation and and. Um, and then she was wrestling with her own demons, God knows. And I, it's interesting now, just so we'd say this now, that she has been in charge of the label for longer than Johnny was. And her, her journey through the, her journey through Versace is different from his. Yeah. But it's equally enthralling, I think, um, from where, from where she started, that the first collection, um, where where she had all the goodwill in the world, you know, everybody showed up. I think the next the next picture is the next, slide. The next picture is a look from that. Um, she had all the goodwill in the world, and um, actually, no, it's not the next picture. It's um, the next, the next, no, the next, oh, the next. This is Linda. Linda, yes, yes. this is from her first collection. Um, after she took over. And you can see there, I guess you see there a, a little bit of an effort to take on board um, maybe what she thought Versace meant for people. Hmm. She had a lot of voices in her ear. She had a lot of people telling her what to do. And um, when, you're, when you're feeling insecure, that's not a great place to be. No. 
So I think, I think we can safely say that her first few collections were um, very, very challenging. I think with all the goodwill that she had, with all the designers who showed up to cheer her on, the other designers, including Armani, who showed up to cheer her on for her first um, co collection for the label. I think it took a while for her to, to find her, to find her feet um, and uh, to, to feel comfortable. Like, so initially, the, initially the, the, one of the easiest things to do, of course, was to take, um, take things that he had done and evolve them. Yes. But um, that didn't always work for her. I think the next picture we have, which is, uh, which is two, two, yeah, two, two years later. We'll get the next um, picture. Thanks. Was a moment where she began creating her own Versace. Yes, yes. You know, and where, she where, successful, her own, her own successful version. You can see with that last picture, it was just she's trying too hard. You can see what she's referencing, but it's not working. And then this one, you think you're channeling him, but you're doing it on your own way. Yes. Yeah. Also, she what she she was she one huge huge thing. You saw this with Sarah Burton at um, at uh, McQueen that when a woman takes over a label that a man has been directing for however long with his own um, particular vocabulary, what she brings what a what a woman's point of view brings to that is a softness and a shape that is instinctive I think it's it sounds like rather a obvious thing to say but the clothes take on she knows what they feel like you know that so the clothes take on a sort of I I don't know if the words authenticity I don't know if that's the right word but I think it be, they began to reflect not her telling her brother what she thinks she should do for him, but what she could do for herself. And I think there was, I think there was a subtle difference. And when she got it right, that was when she took charge of the label. And this dress, of course, I mean, the, the reason why this became so outrageously successful was because Jennifer Lopez wore it to the Grammys. Yes. And that was one of those, that was her with, with the dress that Elizabeth Hurley wore to the premiere, the safety pin dress that Elizabeth Hurley wore to the premiere, which was a gigantic fashion moment for all time. You yes. can actually put in safety pin dress into Google and that's what comes yes. up. This was her safety pin dress. Yes, exactly. Yeah. she also did these great suits too and oh, pants. Yes. I mean I think yes. this was also something that was hers in a way it's not it's not copies of his suits at all this is something very fresh for her because she she said all along that everybody thinks Versace is prints and it's true when people thought of Versace they did think we just saw a gorgeous print by yeah. but she also said Versace was an incredible tailor and she took up that she took up the tailoring as her as her commitment. But there's something else about this collection. This is when this is when she was just doing slam dunk after slam dunk for a while there. This was that fabulous collection that was called Valley of the Dolls collection. Yes, Steve yes, Mizell yes. called it the Valley of the Dolls collection. He did all those amazing photographs when every, every season Versace would produce that collection book, that sort of lookbook thing. And he did this amazing series of photographs of Regina Granville and Amber Valletta in a house in Beverly Hills, which was turned into a exhibition which toured galleries all over the world, including the White Cube in London. And this is Georgina Granf Granville as the archetypal kind of bored Hollywood wife. Yeah. And this collection was such, I think, I think it was such a sort of challenge if, if in the same way that 
that people would say to Versace, your clothes are so vulgar, and he'd all but say, why, thank you. <laughs> she challenged good taste in this yeah. collection. Yeah. And those, it, those advertising images were so brilliant. Oh, those were among the best ever, ever produced. Ever. They were so amazing. I mean, Mizell could read her mind. Never mind that Stephen Mizell is a genius, but he could read Avedon and Gianni Versace, Mizell and Donatella Versace. Yes. I think that that was a that was a really sensational pairing. Well, we're back to Prince with a new kind of psychedelia, not Baroque so much. This is really sort of psychedelic. And something interesting um, to say about Amber Valletta here, I think, this was the opening look of this, of this particular show, that Donatella, she would do shows where the models looked like her, where the models deliberately had these really yeah. long, straight, blonde wigs on. Um, and she, it, I always thought, Something that people have never ever really known about her is she has the most brilliant sense of humor. And she is able to laugh at herself in ways that probably people, she's so, she is very shy and very kind of nervous. Well, she was very shy and very nervous um, when, when she's faced by big crowds of strangers, but she is so funny and witty and lovable. And I always I love the fact that she had this alter ego in her shows. And, and for a long time, Amber Valletta was her alter ego. And it was like, you know, what, what would be your dream? If it, your dream would be to have like Amber Valletta being you in real life. Like remember Andy Warhol used to send yes. out yes. Alan Midget. He would send Alan Midget to, to, to in-person appearances dressed like him. And nobody would ever know what's an Andy Warhol. <laughs> I mean, obviously people knew that was Amber Valletta and not Donatella Versace, but I can't help but thinking somewhere there was this sort of little, again, like her brother, there was a sort of Warholian. We could probably create a huge big Warholian superstructure for the entire Versace good. story. Yeah. But I love that she had such a great sense of humor. I remember her being mocked on something like Saturday Night Live and then she oh. went on the show and she was such a good sport and she was so <laughs> she totally loved it she absolutely was really into it and it was wonderful suddenly you just loved her even more yeah I mean so she was so she is just lovable she just is and and just something that somebody does uh, some, something that people will never know about her you know unless you get, get to spend time with her but Take it, take my word for it. She is extremely lovable. Let's look at the next one. Now, I think if tailoring was something like you, you mentioned the suit, that, that mm -hmm. suit was so sharp and she did those suits really well. The other uh, Donatella signature was, the, was, the, was a goddess dress. Yes. She would do these in every show. Yeah. And Julia Segner here in this draped, you know, high on thigh, that was a real Donatella thing, high on the thigh. Yeah. Angelina Jolie wore one of those dresses, didn't yes. she, to the Oscars? And I mean, she had to kind of stick her leg out and emphasize that she was, she had to slit up to the thigh. That was, that's, that's the other Donatella signature, yes. I think. That, 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 that super glamour. Um, her, her brother obviously was a specialist in glamour, but this was her her version of it. And I do love somewhere in the backstory, the idea of these two kids, Jenny and Donatella, well, she would much, much younger than, but the two kids in their mother's dress salon mm -hmm. while their mother was making incredibly glamorous dresses for the women in this, the last city in Italy, you know, on the, the toe of the boot or whatever. Um, the idea of the idea of glamour being this kind of aspirational dream, I suppose, which is quite a kind of fashion archetype. What about the Medusa image? Do you know where he got that, how he thought of that image for his company? They one of the first things he did when he became successful is he was looking to 
create an environment. He was looking to find a place that manifested his success. You know, every designer wants, wants a place that says, oh, I'm doing well. You know, you have a shop, but then you have a headquarters. And on Via Gesù, um, there, there was a palazzo that, um, who was it? Was it the Mondadori's or uh, some old Italian family had a palazzo on Via Gesù and they needed, they needed the, I don't know if they'd fallen on hard times, but they were breaking it up and renting out bits of it. And Versace rented um, a part of this palazzo and the doorknob of the palazzo was a Medusa head. And mm -hmm. when he went to look at the palazzo, uh, for the first time, there was the Medusa head there, and he said, "That's, that's mine." It. Wow, that's what I, that's what I have read. Yes, um, I like that story. There might be another one, but uh -huh. um, anyway, the the Medusa head was the doorknob, of, and eventually they took over the whole place, and that became you know Palazzo Versace, where they had the shows and everything. But um, uh, you know, it's. With his whole knowledge of the iconography of Italian art, it's still, even if it was accidental that he came across that, it obviously must have been immensely meaningful to him from the beginning. Well, remember that Re Reggio Calabria um, was Reggio, I think the town is the area Reggio Calabria and the town is Reggio, but it was when Magna Graeca, when the Greeks, when the Greeks kind of colonized that yes. part of Italy during the, when the Greek empire was at its peak, that it was an incredibly important trading city. It was one of the most important trading cities in the Mediterranean. Um, so, and then it, when it did fall on hard times later on, there was literally one single highway that connected yeah. it with the rest of Italy. So it passed into the shadows of history. But it was surrounded by obviously incredible ruins. Yeah. And the kids played in the ruins. Yeah. So I think that iconography uh, that's sort of mythical, the, the, the myths and legends would have seemed relatively, the myths and legends of antiquity would have seemed quite present to them, yes. I would think. Yes. And and I I mean you do you the the key, the the um the key as well he incorporated into yes, his yes, iconography. Another, another antique emblem, yeah. Let's look at the next one. Oh, wow. This was so this, wonderful, this sort of bathrobe coat. You know, this to me was, I remember this, when this when Karen Elson walked out in this, in this outfit, it was the first look in, um, let me see, I'm looking it up. The first look in, Autumn, winter, 2016. That that the fall couture from 2016. I felt that this particular look was when she owned Versace. I thought this is when she totally made it her own. Um, you know, admittedly, it was some years, some years after everything else that had happened. But but it's one of, it's one of my favorite looks that she ever did for yeah. for the house. Um, it had the slouch, it had the trench, yeah. it had the structure, it had the gorgeous color scheme. The coloring, the coloring yeah. is amazing. Yeah, I think um, I think it was because to me, to me, couture was always a challenge for her because couture requires the maestro's touch in a way. And doing couture and ready to wear for, for all that time, um, it, it always felt to me like couture was a little hard for her to get her, her hooks into, but I thought this look was just incredible. I really, I was so, you know, so happy for it when I saw that come out. Let's look at the next one. Ah, oh. well, this this was, you know, when I when I talked before about her owning um, owning the past, she she was able to do it. Um, she was able to do it with most things, and then and then there was just always that last show. Um, but but then this was her tribute show. This was this was her. Uh, it was twenty years since Johnny's murder, so she wanted to 
I just, I, I, it was a brilliant move. It could have been, it could have been, I don't know, melancholy perhaps, but it was an absolute triumph. She had all the, all the new supermodels wearing, um, she, she brought back all the sort of classic Versace tropes, the, the, the animal print, the, um, the, the, the Renaissance, the Rococo, the, the, uh, the Western stuff, uh, I'm going through it now, I'm looking at all, the, the Marine, the Vogue, the, um, the Marilyn and James Dean, the, and then the Mesh at the end, she had the great girls from days of yore, five of the top models coming out with her. It just blew the roof off. And it felt, it felt so incredibly right. You know, this is something that's funny about fashion, that about there's something about designers. You know, there are so many amazing designers who you always wish that, and musicians, same thing. You wish that they'd revisit past glories, that it shouldn't be something they don't do, that it should be something to celebrate. There have been there have been designers who, you know, who move on in time and never really recover the splendors of their of their of their peak moments. And I'm, I'm not saying they should they should repeat past triumphs just to sort of recapture glory. But when, when there's a whole new audience that never experienced it first time round, I'm a great believer that if, if you're experiencing something for the first time, it doesn't matter if two, 20 generations before you have seen chain, um, uh, you know, metal mesh miniskirts, this is the first time you've seen it. Yes. And you know, it has that impact for you. And that's what I loved about this show. Everything looked fresh, everything looked new. Um, for people who could remember the quotes, yeah, it, they were, it was the past revisited, but in a way that made it just look right. Yeah, it and was I a think, triumphant show. Oh, triumphant, triumphant. I, I mean, there's, in, my, in my whole career in fashion, my many hundreds of years in fashion, it is definitely one of the great, fashion shows yeah were you there no sadly would have been wonderful to see live it was it was this was this was i loved her stories about this particular when they all walked out at the end because you know they were all who they were because of there, there was a lot of jostling yeah. and <laughs> I thought that was rather funny because it's kind of what you want to hear. You want to hear something with sweetness and light that actually, <laughs> you, you wouldn't have Betty, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and, you know, whoever walking down a catwalk together and it would, it would all be right. sweetness and light. Yeah. Let's get, oh, yes. Now this corset is a really, really an interesting take on corsetry in general and on Versace's kind of high, low, Baroque Rococo skirt and simple little top. Here a t-shirt instead of a, a denim shirt. I think that this was, uh, it, it, after, after, the, after the tribute show, I think that what Donatella took on board as being something modern was a sort of everything approach. That, that rigor, that rigor and, and a sort of monochrome ethos, whatever, had maybe served their time, served it well, but what she was feeling here was a sort of celebratory tribalism, and so in the in the collection itself, it was the collection was called the Clans of Versace, and so there was a lot of tartan, but there was also all this other stuff that brought together 
the clans of, of the clans of Versace, the, the, the sort of tribes of Versace as yeah. well. But but the, the notion, the notion of just putting a corset over a t-shirt, that was her. You know, that 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 sort of embodied the kind of ease, I think, of of and then a great big, a great big flouncy sort of or yeah. almost Charles Jamesian, but skirt. Um, that sort of, or, or actually thinking back, you know, remember Isaac Mizrahi, a t-shirt yes, and a yes, huge big that's ball right. gown. Did that too. Yeah. I, it, it, and that's Bill Glass did a version of that with a little sweater top and a big skirt. Yeah. The sort of easiness, the sort of, that felt quite modern. Do you think? I do think so. And I th the skirt also reminds me of his, of Gianni's amazing silk shirts for men. Yeah. With a rope collar and, you know, sort of how he styled them open on the guy's chest and had all these very, very sexy. You'll have to do another book about Gianni's clothes for men and Donatello's yep. clothes for men. That would have been, that would have been, you know, people have said to me about this book, why is there no menswear? Well, honestly, 120 shows. <laughs> 120 book. women shows. Do another well, book. I would say when you delve into the menswear, there isn't the variety. You wouldn't get, you wouldn't get, on. I mean, I mean, 120 shows, you do get 120 statements, believe it or not, or actually more than that, because each show was, there's a multitude of worlds within each show, but the men's doesn't really pan out like that. Um, and you could, you could pick up on various little periods and probably do a great book about Versace menswear. Yeah. The silk shirts could definitely have a whole book. Silk shirts are so fabulous. A whole book, yeah. There's a shop in Tokyo that only sells stuff. Well, it might not, might not still be the last time I was there. It only sold stuff relating to South Beach. You know oh, how, spe how specific yes. the Japanese. Oh, I know, I, you love it, love it. So there was a lot of that. Miami Vice memorabilia and whatever oh. in the store, but there were racks of Versace silk shirts, racks and racks of them. Fabulous. How did they find them all? Quite fabulous. Fabulous. And now no. the famous, oh my God, the famous, famous image. Speaking about Donatella creating moments in Versace history, owning a moment and proving how she was in the end, despite what people said, with that incredible legacy, that incredibly formidable legacy that she inherited, was able to uh, project Versace into a new world. She, I, she's, she's always very keen on technology and um, very, very, uh, on, very on top of, um, gadgets and yes. you know new things going on very very keen to know what was in a way that her brother wasn't her brother was a little rooted in even though he was capable of making an incredible media um media statements he he was he was he, he loved art and 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 opera and so on and and she was much more the rock chick um and, and I think this show where she, she had, um, she had uh, initially, uh, let me see, it was spring, summer 2020. So that was just before the world went wrong. Um, she had Google images, uh, actually it was Google tilt brush, brush technology because apparently Google image was inspired by when Jennifer Lopez wore this dress to the Grammys, there were so many searches on Google for her in this look that Google crashed. Yes, yes. So that inspired Google to create Google images. This Jennifer Lopez in this dress. So what better way to own technology in fashion than to have Jennifer Lopez recreate the Grammy moment in the dress that Amber Valletta wore originally on this catwalk in spring, summer 2020. 
And uh, on the, this, I'm reading this now, but on the on the soundtrack, um, the, the there was streaming images on the wall, and it was uh -huh. Jennifer, Jennifer Lopez in the dress, and then and then um, Donatello's voice cutting through the racket, saying, "Okay, Google, now show me the real jungle dress." And <laughs> out walked Jennifer Lopez in the dress. You can imagine Fabulous. the place went absolutely insane, and Fabulous. and you know it just it it was just again that whole thing of of how happy everyone was for her how happy everyone was for Donatella that to come through everything she'd come through and 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 obviously she she'd already done years of collections before this happened but um the quintessential fashion survivor. Yes. But to survive with this, to survive with a triumph, you know, that, that was, and then to go on, obviously there's been things since then yes. that she, she's owning, she's owning technology in new ways after this collection. But I think that um, the, it, it's great. Everybody was very invested in her when she took over from Johnny and everybody wanted the best for her. And so I think that it's, it's, a, it's great to have stories like that in fashion yes. because we know there were a lot that didn't turn out quite so well. Um, in her case, um, she's a winner. Well, the book is a winner too, Tim. This is really a, a triumphant, fascinating book. I'm so glad that you did it. I hope you'll do another one. I am going to do another one. Can you tell us who? No, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you afterwards. I'll okay. Tell you. All right. Yeah. I'll keep. No, I, I love doing these books because they're a massive amount of research. Because what happens, and I have to say, I, all credit to my um, editor Adelia Sabatini at Thames and Hudson because um, the. If you if you if you're looking at if you're looking at a designer's work before about the mid '80s, it's there's we have such access to everything now. But you'd be amazed how little there is before. Very hard to find it, yeah. Especially in the '70s, and and also the the standard of fashion commentary was kind of interesting. Um, it because fashion was a very very particular industry in those days. It was for the cognoscenti. It wasn't. It wasn't that kind of. It wasn't. It wasn't a mass entertainment. The no. way the way it became. The, the Gianni Versace turned it. Helped turn it yeah. into a mass entertainment. So it, it's a challenge to find things. It's a challenge to put yourself in the space. And uh, I mean, it's easy. It was easy for me once it turned into the shows that I was actually at because I could. I could just write about what I remembered, but. Um, for shows that were a long time ago and especially the whole fashion machine was completely yes. different yeah and so you you want to recap you want to capture all of that um and also illuminate what the designers are doing so i would love to do that for god i can think of a number of people i would love to do that for excellent well thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about the book i um i hope everybody enjoys it as much as I enjoyed working on it.